Hello everybody. I'm Helena Cobbin, the president of Just World Educational. Thanks for being with us today for this ninth session in our 10 part webinar series, Common Sense on Syria. Today, we'll be learning about the effects that various kinds of sanctions have had on the well being of Syria's 20 million people. Our panelists today are Dr. Asa Roshaya, a British Syrian engineering professor and philanthropist who is with us from London, and Dr. Adnan Azuz, a Syrian professor and labor expert who is with us from Damascus. You already have their impressive resumes, and I shall introduce them properly a little later. Before I do that, I want to invite you all to take part in a little snap poll, the results of which can help, our, help guide our discussions further on in this webinar. Here it is. Okay, I hope you can do two things at once, answer our snap poll and listen to my dulcet tones. While you're working on your answers, I have some other news for you. Originally, we had planned to present 10 webinars in this project with the final one scheduled for this Saturday being on the crucial topic of finding ways to end the conflict in Syria. For that final session, we thought it particularly important to focus on the views and ideas of panelists from Syria. But when we initially planned this series, we had failed to note that the holy month of Ramadan is due to start either today, either tomorrow or Friday. And of course, in the early part of Ramadan, it would be a huge imposition to ask people to take time away from their families to be a panelist for our webinar. It is also still the period of Christian Orthodox Easter, and that is important in Syria too. We always knew that we wanted to prepare any event that we do on this crucial topic as thoroughly as we could. So we have decided to postpone what we present on the topic of ending Syria's conflict until another time. And this might end up being just one excellent webinar that would present a range of views, or it might end up being a short series of webinars. Stay tuned for that. Now, let's get back to the present webinar on the impact that sanctions have had on Syria's reconstruction and public health. Just a couple of quick housekeeping things here. As you probably know by now, on our webinars, you can communicate with the Just World Elves, whom we have working behind the scenes here, by using the chat button that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our Elves can answer any technical questions you have, and they will also be queuing up and reviewing any substantive questions you want to pose to the panelists during the Q&A session that we'll have in the latter part of the webinar. We're delighted that our Chief Elf is our distinguished board member, Dr. Alice Rothschild. So if you want to ask a question of the panelists, please submit it via the chat box. Word it succinctly and have it be an actual question. We also ask you to keep your questions today to the topic of today's session. Now I'm going to close that poll. And let me turn to welcoming our first panelist, Dr. Adnan Azuz, who is with us from Damascus. Hello, Adnan. Hi, how are you? I'm very glad to, uh, of course, be among these uh, very influential people all around the world. It's my privilege. It's great to have you. Um, and I know that you will add to the conversation. And Dr. Aysa Sha'er, we have you with us from London. Good to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. So first, I'm going to turn to Adnan and ask you to give us your perspective, especially as someone who works with the trade, u the trade union movement there in Damascus, on the effects of sanctions. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to say uh, good evening to everyone. Here it's around 8 p.m. according to Damascus uh, time. Um, our topic is very uh, uh, influential in uh, our Syrian peoples and workers in general. For us, uh, the issue of sanctions have raised a lot of uh, endurance and resistance uh, in our lives. Uh, as you know, the Syrian war now has lasted over than nine years. 
and from the very beginning the what has made this war much worse for all uh, our people and workers uh, is the sanction of course we have very uh, bad and um, struggle all around the country it was of course now things are much better but at that time these sanctions have contributed in increasing the suffering of our workers and people i will be specific in order to clarify this point uh, at the beginning we, uh, when we, these sanctions have been uh, issued by us and eu uh, in turn um, a lot of factories uh, international multinational companies who were working in Syria have to shut down and close their factories in order and they left the country. This left our workers who were working at these uh, factories uh, out of work. They have been uh, unemployed. Uh, of course, I'm not going to speak about the terrorist attacks uh, for these factories and uh, stealing and looting of our. This is not uh, what we are going to speak to focus on. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, all uh, workers' life have, be, have been worsened. Not only this, because these factories are part. I'm also speaking about Syrian factory. And the necessary supplies that they usually bring from outside Syria in order to have uh, the process of production moving on. Because as you know, according to these sanctions, no one is allowed to um, contribute or send or sell or buy anything from Syrian people. So this made the uh, production wheel uh, very uh, slow and we have to depend on only supplies from inside the country which also uh, has uh, caused more unemployment rate uh, among Syrians. Uh, this is one uh, side of the, uh, of the issue. Uh, um, when, when we speak now, after the liberation of most of the Syrian land, of course, we are speaking about uh, having a lot of countries and companies who would like to come to Syria in order to participate in the process of reconstruction. But unfortunately, because of these sanctions, they are afraid if they come over here, they are going to be um, uh, facing a lot of punishments. Of course, I'm speaking about legal issues, about financial issues, bank issues. So they are going to be frozen uh, in the full meaning of the word, which makes now life much harder because after the liberation of most of the Syrian land, a lot of Syrians are coming from outside Syria, inside Syria, in order to live uh, with their uh, uh, family members, with their friends, and so on. But they cannot do so now because of these sanctions. They cannot go home because they know that they are not going to have jobs. They are not going to have uh, better life conditions. Mm, so because the whole economy process is frozen out of these sanctions. Of course, the Syrian government is doing what they can, but of course, they cannot do this by themselves because we are speaking about nine years of war that have uh, taken uh, a lot of uh, the assets uh, of, of what uh, is found in the Syrian uh, government uh, budget. So for us, uh, the raising the sanctions is going to help uh, Syrian workers to get back to their um, vital role. This is uh, in, in one aspect. Also, uh, I spoke with uh, many people uh, uh, at the ILO, uh, and I, I told them, well, you are doing a very good job by training uh, Syrians outside Syria at the uh, refugees uh, camps, uh, either in Turkey or Jordan or Lebanon. This is very good. They are making training for them in order to make rehabilitation and their uh, capacity to do uh, better kinds of jobs. This is very good. But I asked them, why do you do this outside Syria? Why don't you come inside Syria and train Syrian people for these types of jobs that we need at the process of the reconstruction? Because in the reconstruction process, we are needing particular types of jobs that can help us uh, because 
a lot of experts uh, from the workers' uh, fields. They, uh, they have fled outside the country. So now we have the problem that we don't have experts uh, who can do the job which is required. Um, this is, of course, a brief uh, uh, note of what uh, we are having. Of course, and if it's okay, I can stop now. If you can, um, it's up to you, Helena, you, you decide. Okay, no, this is really a helpful snapshot. We had um, one question, the, you referred to the ILO, I guess not everybody is uh, expert, so the, I think that's the International Labor Organization. International Labor Organization, yes. That is associated with the, uh, with the UN. With the UN, yes, exactly. So, um, I did want to ask about what you can tell us about the um, coronavirus um, prevention and mitigation efforts there in Damascus. I gather most of you are living on a lockdown now, but um, yes. it must be very difficult for the public health authorities to um, be able to, to respond to the, to the crisis with the sanctions. Do you have any information about that? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, of course, as you know, it, the COVID-19 is everywhere. But of course, in a country that has already suffered nine years of war, facing uh, such a, um, a pandemic is a very uh, hard work. And as you can see, in most of the advanced countries in the world, they are really having lack of uh, um, all medical supplies and health and uh, issues. Of course, for us uh, in Damascus, uh, in Syria in general, of course, the Syrian government has followed a protocol of protection for uh, our people. Um, of course, uh, now we, we need these sanctions to be raised now more than ever in order to uh, uh, import these uh, supplies, these, these health supplies to Syria in order to help the Syrian government in order to be able to diagnose and make the, the proper uh, health uh, procedures for uh, those who are affected or who are might be affected or who are suspicious to be affected by the co uh, COVID-19. Uh, what I can say in, in, in my uh, part as uh, uh, in the workers' organization is the following. So far, uh, of course, as you say, we have a full uh, curfew and uh, of course lockdown of all aspects of life. Now, uh, the Syrian government has uh, taken a resolution to pay uh, subsidies for those whose uh, job has stopped out of this uh, uh, lockdown. So they decide to give them two months salary for each one whose work has stopped. I'm speaking about the non-organized sector of economy, not about the public sector because they are already taking their salaries while they are at home. I'm speaking about the non-organized uh, sector of uh, uh, economy. So this is in one aspect. Uh, for us, as a General Federation of Trade Unions in Syria, representing workers, we have started a mission of uh, sanitizing all uh, workplaces and factories in cooperation with other, of course, other organizations in order to secure the health and professional uh, conditions of our workers, the safety and occupational health. Um, in, in addition to this also, uh, we have, as the Federation, we have helped in sewing some um, suits for the doctors and nurses with a high quality in order to secure their security at these harsh times, because as you see, we have lack of all medical supplies because of the sanctions. So we are doing our best, of course, to help, but of course, uh, we need it from the international community to help us to, to provide us with the sufficient supplies. It must be very, very difficult there, I can only imagine. Um, I have something that I want to share here uh, with the, uh, listeners because um, this is a uh, an article that was published um, actually a year ago and it it's about it's by Aaron Lund and it tells a lot about how sanctions affect 
humanitarian aid organizations working throughout the whole of Syria. And I'm going to provide people with the link for that, um, that article later. Um, but it's a very helpful article and really helps people to understand exactly what you, you're talking about, Adnan. Um, so Thank stay you. on the line because I think I, I, I want to um, turn, turn to Asa. And Asa, I think you have a, a little um, slideshow, a, a slide presentation to share with us. Yes, thank you. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to try and share with you my screen and hopefully uh, I'll be able to share this uh, presentation well. Is it coming through? Yes, can you, can you make it uh, full screen? Yeah. Certainly. People love our slideshows. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Helena, and uh, good to be with you also. I'd like to uh, issue a personal statement first. I'd like to highlight that the data I've collated here is um, ba based on personal research collated uh, from open sources. And um, I hope the information I present um, are useful for our discussion today. Um, I also would like to highlight that with the spread of COVID-19, the medical sector, as Dr. Adnan has highlighted, all over the world, in Syria and other countries, are in dire need of essential supplies and support. These are people who are risking their lives to ensure the safety of others. And we surely should have the moral responsibility to try and support those um, people. Um, in terms of um, the actual presentation itself, I'm trying to... Sorry, it's froze. Somebody is taking control of my... Okay, brilliant. So in order to look at the current situation in Syria. It is, uh, I think it's important to uh, look at Syria pre-2011 and in particular at the medical sector. Um, in Syria, from the research I've gathered and I've done, there, there were uh, 500 hospitals, 131 state hospitals, state-run hospitals, and approximately 370, 369, according to the figures I found, private hospitals. And there were 56,000 doctors operating in Syria, across Syria, with, within the, these hospitals and the other health centers, which goes up to about 1,700. Uh, in 2011, there was plans, I recall, for 24 hospitals. Um, I, you know, I, was, I was to, have been living in London and I, uh, then, and I live in London now. And I remember there was the... Uh, European Union were very keen to support initiatives to build more hospitals in Syria. However, as the war started and as consequences of the war in Syria and the unfortunate losses of the many, many, many civilians in Syria, the hundreds of thousands of um, fellow Syrians have lost their lives uh, to this dreadful war. 5.6 million Syrians have become refugees and 6.2 million Syrians were displaced internally. However, we still have issues. There is currently, according to World Vision, between 12, depending on the figures, between 12 to, uh, to 13.5 million within Syria who need humanita humanitarian assistance. Nearly half of those are children. And at the same time, there are over 6 million inside Syria that still require treatment from the traumas of war and the nine years of uh, the misery that war has brought. At the same time, there's millions outside and inside Syria looking for the humane bridge that could take them back to their homes.
Now, the current medical infrastructure in Syria. So the current infrastructure, there is a lot of hospitals, lots and lots of hospitals within Syria that are not operational. They have been damaged during the war, some partially and some completely damaged. Out of the 131 hospital, state hospitals that I listed in the first slide, there is only 73 in operation. That's just approximately around 50% of the um, hospitals that existed at the time. In terms of the private hospitals, same thing, same uh, aspects. Out of the 376 hospitals, only 45% of these hospitals are still operational. The, there is 20% that's fully damaged, and there are also about 30, 34% that are partially damaged. So there is a dire need to rebuild these hospitals and to start um, supporting the medical uh, infrastructure in Syria. In terms of medical centers, uh, originally there was 1750 and um, unfortunately half of these are either partially damaged or fully damaged and operational or some unknowns only 50 percent of these 1750 are still um, operating inside syria many uh, equipments have been looted but also at the same time doc some many doctors have lost their lives and many medics have uh, left the country or moved to other places. Again, the ambulances, many ambulances have been destroyed. In terms of the pharmaceutical pre-2011 or um, in 2019, Syria had 70 factories, medical factories, medicine factories, and employed 30,000 workers. And this medical factories used to supply the local need in terms of medicines, approximately 95%. And they, Syria used to export to many other countries around the world, 54, as I have found from the uh, literature. The current situation is that out of these 70 factories, only six of these factories are still fully operational. Uh, 53 are completely damaged, 8 are working at uh, half capacity, 3 at quarter of their capacity. I, during my research, um, I, I know I did come across that um, there was uh, plans to build hospitals and Syria managed to get some kind of uh, allowance to build 11 factories. Uh, um, in 2017. However, my, the research I did uh, um, showed only four have reached full uh, um, final stage productions. As a result, I'm hearing from doctors that there has been a surge of um, various uh, diseases uh, return like uh, tuberculosis, polio, measles, typhoid, all of these due to the lack of vaccinations in Syria. In terms of homes and social institutes, you know, we know that many, many homes have been destroyed in Syria. You know, we're talking about millions of homes have been destroyed, but all these needs to be repaired. And the, the future of the people returning to their homes depend on the support that they are given in terms to rebuild their lives. In 2017, over 0.6 million internally displaced returned to their homes. And in 2018, that reached about a million. However, those people who are returning, they still need support in order to rebuild their lives and their homes. The same thing, there is a lack of uh, water during the summertime, so filtration systems, engineering parts for water pumps are lacking, and these are sitting under the 
sanctions, the embargoes. I'll come to the electrics. I think this is a, a really important topic. This highlights the, whether it be fair or, or unfair sanctions. 34 of the 54 power stations in Syria are still out of actions. And for many Syrians, uh, electricity comes by installments of almost a few hours a day. Um, this affects health and education, I'm sure, as you would all agree. But one thing, when you look at the EU restrictive measures, the Article 12 of the EU restrictive measures into Syria, there is a prohibition of sale or supply or transfer of any ec or export of any technologies to be used in the construction, installation of Syria's power plants or electricity production. So currently, as you can see on the right hand side, these power stations, many of these power stations are, cannot be repaired because of the lack of the availability of parts to repair these uh, power stations. I'd like to summarize here by saying that the suffering of the Syrian people has gone beyond all bounds. And it's time for the, for the international community to overcome political hostilities and wars and to try and support the Syrian peoples. Sanctions are affecting the ordinary people. At the same time, they're creating social injustice, you know, mass poverty versus rich few warlords. Um, we need to encourage the international community to look at sanctions as the lifting of sanctions as a humanitarian need for the Syrian people. And with COVID-19 um, currently expanding around the world, it is essential for the world to treat the Syrian people in the same eye and the same perspectives as others and support them medically. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, could you uh, turn off the screen sharing thing at the top? Okay. Uh, <laughs> That was uh, very sobering. Actually, my first question was going to be how smart are the sanctions? But I think both uh, Dr. Adnan and Dr. Asa have kind of uh, answered that question for me. It's something that, that we here in the peace movement in the United States worried a lot about in the 1990s regarding Iraq when uh, Madeleine Albright talked about 500,000 Iraqi children dying as a result of sanctions was an acceptable price to pay. Um, and then we were promised that there would be smart sanctions. But um, Dr. Adnan, do you think these ones are smart? <laughs> Actually, uh, if it could be smart in case that you interfere to solve problems, not to create worse problems for people. If people are in the case of war, you have to interfere as a big brother to help people solve their problems, not to make these problems worse and worse. This is what I understand. If someone consider himself or herself as the leader of the world, they should interfere to solve problems, not to make these problems much worse. Yeah, I think, you know, when we were promised smart sanctions, we were promised that they would just target the leaders concerned rather than the people. Um, but these ones seem to be affecting the people. Um, we had a question from one of the attendees. Who is doing these sanctions? Um, are they United Nations sanctions? I don't know which, which of you would like to answer that. Well, it, it's governments now introducing sanctions. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, I could speak only for the European Union sanctions currently and your initial um, questions about whether it be a smart sanctions. I think they are, in my personal opinion, they are a damaging sanctions to the ordinary people. For the reason it's the ordinary person is now being feeling a hostage for whomever is bringing in the supplies or the, to, to, to warlords or to the um, 
to the various aspects that are happening. So that if we need to um, look at the aspects of the benefits of the Syrian people, the ordinary Syrian peoples, then sanctions should address that part and should be uh, considered you know, transportation is a daily need of the Syrian people. Currently, transport material, you know, cars, trucks cannot be exported into Syria. So I believe it is the political establishment which are creating these sanctions. Yes. Um... People, I think many people think that these are United Nations sanctions and that therefore they may be, you know, a little bit legitimate for that reason. But actually, no. um, in my research, I found that the UN sanctions were um, very different. They were imposed primarily in the 2005 era and were related to accusations about the uh, assassination of Prime Minister Hariri in Lebanon and they were targeted at individuals. So they were what you might call smart sanctions. And I think they still exist, but the sanctions that we've been talking about, hearing about from Dr. Adnan and Dr. Aysa are, um, as, as they said, imposed by individual governments, not by the UN, imposed by individual governments that have obviously a political um, goal in mind. And in fact, the United Nations has um, somebody, and I'm going to share. Okay, so there is my um, link to the Aaron Lund piece. So the, the United Nations has somebody called the Special Rapporteur on the negative impact of unilateral coercive measures. Um, that is actually, his, he's called um, uh, Idris... El Jazeera, and he made a report in September 2018, really slamming the way that these sanctions were affecting the um, the Syrian people. So, from that perspective, that's from the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights, and he is the special rapporteur on san on sanctions. He's saying that they are being done all wrong and they are really harming the Sy Syrian people. So I think it's, it's worth our um, attendees here understanding that these are not United Nations sanctions that are hurting the Syrian people. These are sanctions by the government of the United States and some European governments. But um, can one of you explain to me how these sanctions, which are imposed by just a minority of governments around the world, how they can um, prevent companies from other countries from doing business with Syria. Like, why couldn't you import things from India or from other countries, Dr. Aysa? Well, it's, uh, I, I'll speak about the, the letter of credit, perhaps it's one of these aspects is that all of this has to go through the European Union to import any goods. And um, as soon as also the, the Syrian banks are not allowed to, uh, to issue a letter of credit, I, my understanding, this is, you know, I'm not uh, living in Syria and I don't um, trade, but I from my humble knowledge is that le you know, Syrian banks are not allowed to issue letter of credit. So all traders, all businessmen now um, are blocked from trading legally through the appropriate channels. So in, in, in that sense, the letter of credit is, is an issue um, the material, getting the material into Syria is, is also trying, getting it into, uh, transporting is, in, is an issue. There is no planes between uh, anywhere in Europe and Syria. It's, it's really difficult. We have to go, you have to go through to Lebanon and then enter into Syria. So that's the, 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 the dire um, issue. At the same time, you know, we have to think about I really would like to go back to one point. Fuel, and I'd like to highlight this point, fuel and 
is a, an essential need of human lives in the winter, especially in countries like Syria. In these cold winters that we've had, and we've had many cold winters, many, many families were shackled around a small fire in a room, wood burning fire, because of the lack of fuel. And yet Syria, there, when there was, I, there was a, a, a shipment, a tanker that was going towards Syria at a time when there was millions of Syrians feeling the bricks of the cold weathers. And then that shipment was stopped. And it is where Syria is not allowed to import fuel from externally. So all of these aspects, it is... I don't know, I don't see the smartness of these sanctions. It's the ordinary people who are being affected. Uh, Dr. Adnan, yes. could you speak more about maybe that fuel issue? Because I remember the, the issue of the tanker bearing the fuel. I think, was that Iranian fuel? Was this linked with Iranian sanctions? How, how, I mean, how much are... U.S. sanctions against Syria linked to U.S. sanctions against Iran. Yes, uh, of course, uh, uh, in addition to what uh, Dr. Raisa has already mentioned, uh, when you ask us, uh, okay, there are other governments in the world who are not uh, following these sanctions. As you said, these sanctions are U.S. and EU sanctions. They are not U.N. sanctions. U U.N. doesn't have any sanction against Syria. Uh, in the sense that you are speaking about. Uh, as uh, Dr. Raisa has said, the fuel issue is one of the most important issues in uh, uh, our Syrian life. According to the Caesar uh, law, which has been uh, issued uh, in the US, no one is allowed to um, purchase or uh, uh, sell or buy anything from Syria. And anyone who makes any uh, deal with uh, Syria, either Syrian government or Syrian uh, members, uh, people, uh, businessmen, or whatsoever, they are going to be under the sanction. So any government in the world or company in the world who would like to have business in Syria uh, or humanitarian aid or uh, to buy or sell any product, they are not allowed according to this law. Therefore, these sanctions imposed by U.S. and EU are affecting all uh, governments and companies around the world. So this is what has uh, uh, mainly uh, affected Syrian people. About the fuel issue and uh, Iran, before these sanctions on Iran, Syria could import uh, the, uh, the Iranian uh, oil, and of course, uh, then they are going to have the fuel out of this in its different shapes. After these sanctions, of course, this has become um, not possible because no ports uh, in the world are going to let these uh, ships uh, or shipments uh, of these uh, uh, oil to be uh, uh, targeting or arriving to Syrian land. So this has, of course, increased the suffering of people especially at winter, because we have very, very cold winter, as the Quraysh has already said. Right. So um, essentially, we, it sounds like what we're talking about is a sort of a US and EU blacklist. So if, if a company in India or Japan wanted to sell something to, to Syria, they wouldn't do it because they would then lose their access to the US market. Is that how it works? A blacklist that is linked, very similar to the blacklist that has been used to suffocate Iran as well. Yes, it is. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, and, and it's also to suffocate the people who visit these countries. Uh, let's, let's not just look at the sanctions. It is if you travel to Syria, on a, or to Iran, and you want to enter the United States, you will be stopped. And this is to suffocate the actual also, not just the countries, but also the peoples who've got families, who've got relations who wants to visit them and, and care for them. It is, it's, it's, it's the majority 
being a victim of all of these so-called smart sanctions. So it does actually sound very similar to what, what, what the Israelis have been doing to Gaza, suffocating them economically and in terms of suffocating their ability to move or do other things. Um, but the Israelis do it through military control in, against Gaza, whereas our government here in the United States does it um, through sort of these economic and financial mechanisms um, with the same goal in mind, both in Iran and in Syria. Is, is, is that a kind of a good picture or not? It's the same. So um, my last question that I wanted to give to both of you is, um, how about the other countries that are, are being sanctioned by the United States in particular, um, Venezuela or uh, Bolivia or Cuba, which is, we have to say, like the grandfather of the countries that have been sanctioned for 70 years or so, um, by 70, 60 years by, by, by the United States. Do you, do you have um, a sense that you, you can learn from those countries how to survive this, or is your situation different? Um, actually, for us, uh, we have our own example. Of course, we, we respect uh, the, their experience, and it's, of course, a fascinating and inspiring experience. But for us uh, in Syria, it is also uh, a long process of sanctions because they have not started in 2011, as you have said, it started in 2004 and after the uh, occupation of Iraq. And it, then it continued in 2005, 6. Every two years we have new, uh, new process of sanctions. For us in Syria, we, we rely on our uh, capacities. Syrian people are very hard working uh, people. This is number one. And also we rely on um, our uh, resources, we are uh, originally, we are uh, an essentially an agricultural country. So we, we do our best to preserve uh, this field as much as we can. In all, of, of course, in addition to maintaining the industrial field as much as we can. But uh, this is our only option. We don't have any other options. Uh, people believe that this is their um, life, they, they have to defend their country, they don't have any other option because other options, uh, as you can see, would be alternatives that they have presented in these terrorist groups, they were very terrifying. Therefore, they, these people stick, our people stick to their choices and they believe that they, by their resistance, uh, everything can change. Mm. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to share the results of the poll we did earlier, and I'm actually I'm I'm very pleased to see uh, that we have a very well informed public here. <laughs> um, so, 48 people took part, and 83% um, of them thought that the sanctions are not smart. And on the question, which year did the U.S. first apply sanctions against Syria that are still in force today. 48% of the people got the right answer, which is 1979. Um, and then um, question, which of the following tools does the U.S. use? Um, again, we got a very smart audience. Um, so we got uh, people could answer multiple answers and we got 65% saying denial of access to payment clearing systems. And then the last question, uh, are, uh, the people who answered did very well indeed. 88% of them um, got the correct answer, which is that sanctions are not authorized by the, or they are not all authorized by the UN. So anyway, there we go. Stop sharing. Thanks everybody who participated in the poll. It really does help our um, panelists to kind of understand the, the level of uh, knowledge that, that our participants and attendees have. Now I'm going to open things up to the floor and bring in our wonderful chief elf, Dr. Alice Rothschild, who has been going through the, uh, through the questions. 
Thank you. So uh, the first question I'm going to give to the panelists is, uh, this is from Michael Goodman. Which factions have the most responsibility for the destruction of the Syrian hospitals? And I would add the assassination of the physicians. And are the white helmets good or bad? I've heard so many conflicting accounts about them. Um, uh, okay. Uh, of course, I answered this. If you, uh, I sent you the answer. Anyway, I'm going to say this uh, in public. Of course, uh, these factions follow various agendas because they follow various uh, employers, as we can call them. But most of them, they agree on destroying the future of Syrian people. Of course, the most terrifying of these factions are um, ISIS in addition to al-Nusra, because these are the most fanatic types of these factions. Uh, if I answer your uh, question. About uh, the, the uh, white helmets, uh, these uh, are the medical face of al-Nusra uh, terrorist group. Uh, they try to fabricate scenarios in order to accuse the Syrian government that they are uh, committing crimes against uh, citizens or uh, they fabricate scenarios uh, that uh, uh, some people are wounded or dead out of chemical attack or so on. Of course, nowadays we know that these all are all fabrications with the um, uh, investigations that have been carried out by uh, Russia when they entered into these areas that uh, these white helmets were fabricating these scenarios and they collected all the evidence that these people that they said they were dead they were alive and they met them and of course if it, chemical weapons were used at that time no one would be alive and these masks that they used to put they are not going to protect anyone as you know if we have chemical attack so the, the they are trying to uh, wash out and uh, um, try to give a good picture of these uh, fanatic groups. Um, this is the bias. Uh, of course, Dr. Raisa is proficient in, in these matters. So. No, no, I, I, I would like to, to highlight it's, it's, I'd like to look at the positive side of rebuilding the hospitals and who do we rebuild these hospitals for rather than go and start pointing the fingers at this stage. The war is about to end. There will, there will be a, perhaps for tens and hundreds of years, people talking, diff, pointing the fingers at different parties. But what matters is, can we build things for the people and what has been destroyed? And when you are trying to reconcile things and rebuild a broke a war broken countries you do not go pointing fingers yes this is the most important how to and, and, and I, so I'd, what i'd like to you know really highlight i'm speaking here as a syrian is and and as syrian living outside it is about time that we stop politicizing the human suffering of the people for political agendas, let's get on with the work. And there were people who needs the, the help and support. They need these hospitals rebuilt. They need these homes to be rebuilt. And these waters to be uh, filtered and cleaned and so on. And those water pumps to have parts that pumps the, pump, the water. I think that's the, that's, the, that's the main aspects I'd like to touch on at this stage. Okay, here's a question uh, that I think relates to all of this uh, from Joshua Landis saying, when confronted with the sanctions questions in Washington panels, I'm always asked how, quote, I expect Assad to be punished, end quote, if I don't support sanctions or the ban on reconstruction aid. How would you answer this question? Can, can you repeat the questions with, from Joshua? <laughs> Apologies. I'm sorry, I have to go find it again. Uh, let me get to it. When confronted with the sanctions question in Washington panels, 
Mm-hmm. I am always asked how I, quote, expect Assad to be punished, end quote, if I don't support sanctions or the ban on reconstruction aid. How would you answer this question? I mean, so for, for the many, many, I don't know where, who can give me, who can give an example where sanctions have not hurt the ordinary people. Yeah, and in the whole times that we have been living, there were sanctions on Saddam Hussein at the time when he was, who was suffering the, the, the effect of the sanctions. It was the people. And then what do we have now? We have a country which is a war-torn country, completely destroyed. Um, if we look at uh, why, and on the other thing, if we are, if we are looking at um, various countries that are committing atrocities around the world, why there is this double standard of imposing sanctions on certain countries, and yet there are other countries, other governments impo- committing atrocities, and yet they are not being sanctioned because they're considered as allies. And you and I, or and, and I think the majority of the people, know who these countries are. Yemen is one of those countries who is being bombarded day and night uh, by uh, plane, war planes coming from Saudi Arabia and what's known as the quote unquote coalitions. And yet there is no sanctions on these countries. Okay, um, this is a question from Holly Gigante. What about families whose homes have been bombed? Where do they go? How is water available to wash? Very on the ground kind of question. Okay, so Dr. Azuz, do you want to? Of course, uh, as you like, uh, it's up to you. Well, you're, I mean, there in, you're there in Damascus, so maybe you can give us this answer. <laughs> of course. Uh, about the uh, people who have been displaced, uh, of course, uh, out of this war, there were many scenarios for them, those who, whose houses have been destroyed. Number one, to go to their um, relatives who live in uh, a safe area and uh, live with them in the same house, still things are going to be better in their uh, homelands. This was scenario number one. Scenario number two, um, the Syrian uh, government started uh, a process of paying back for uh, people who uh, lost their uh, houses or it has been partially or totally destroyed. They used to give them money in order to rebuild these houses. Um, uh, usually, they are the, the, those who are partially destroyed, they could... Uh, uh, supply them with uh, money in order to reconstruct uh, their houses. Okay. And Can also, I, yes, sorry. Sorry, I, I'd like to touch on, on something, a very, very important aspect. The will of the Syrian people is very, very strong. And, and that's really, really important to make things in such a, a, a crisis. And the, the way people have been connecting, I was, when I visited, I was really um, um, uh, taken um, uh, back by the way people are working together in order to help each other in such, a, such situations. And if I may say, like, um, so some people are doing rainwater harvesting, collecting rainwater during the winters. Uh, the, the issue is actually in the drinking water, in getting drinking water to the properties. And that, it's not the lack of supply sometimes, it is the lack of the pumping power, which could take the water from the wells into the homes. Yes, especially in, in Aleppo and homes, there were a lot of troubles out of this because because of the sanctions, uh, Syrian government doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, have the uh, possibility to uh, import fuel in order to have electricity uh, working. Uh, so this, uh, of course, uh, pumping machine is not going to work out of this. 
Okay, here's a question from Philip Davies. Um, outside of military aid, how much assistance is Russia providing and what would be required to relieve sanctions from the European Union and others? Would you please repeat because I cannot see the question. Okay, it's um, outside of military yes. aid, yes. how much assistance is Russia providing and what is required to relieve sanctions from the European Union and others? Okay, of course, uh, in uh, 2015, it was uh, the beginning of the um, aid that Russia has provided for Syrian people in order to, uh, um, to fight uh, these uh, fanatic groups. Um, so far, uh, it has been a long process. It's uh, more over than five years uh, so far. Uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, Russia is helping also in medical supplies. For instance, uh, just uh, three days ago, a um, whole plane coming from Russia uh, in order to assist Syrian people uh, with the health uh, care and in order to face uh, COVID-19 was sent uh, from Russia. So uh, for us, it, it was uh, the first thing uh, coming from outside uh, Syria helping us in, in this uh, COVID-19 crisis. So of course, they are uh, giving things, but of course, we, we, we know that uh, now the whole inter, uh, world is suffering from lack of things. But for us, uh, this was very um, beneficial, let me say, uh, at this stage, of course. Probably um, one last question, Alice, um, and then we're going to have to wrap things up. So this is a question about um, how the sanctions are preventing the rebuilding that's necessary for refugee return and thus exacerbates the refugee problem. Can you comment on that and what attention needs to be paid to the refugee crisis? Ab absolutely. I mean, this is a, a really important uh, point and the, as you saw, there, ha there has been many, um, internally displaced Syrians, they've, as I've given in my figure and presentations, um, 0.6 million returned to their homes, and then in 2018, 1 million. Some of those also were external refugees who returned to their homes from Lebanon. There was some who returned to their homes from Turkey and Europe. There was a documentary here on um, uh, on British television, uh, I think it was the BBC, showing that how refugees from Europe are returning back to Syria. This is a, a and those people, what do they want to? Do? How can you help them to return back to their lives? Is to rebuild that country, to rebuild something, an infrastructure which they would be happy and safe to go back to. It's some something they could build a future for their themselves and their families and their kids future to come we owe it to future generation whether be it in syria or whether be it those people all around the world to encourage them and support them so that they there is a bridge there's that humanitarian bridge that could take them back to their country where they belong to living as a refugee uh, it, it's not easy and it is heartbreaking when you see somebody who who was supporting educating developing in their own country is now living outside their country and in a um, waiting for a ferry to port them from Calais in France to 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 the, to the UK um, or to smuggle them and be be a, be hostage for those smugglers. It's something that we need to look at and consider for the future. So thank you. Um, I don't know, Dr. Azuz, do you have something to say about, uh, about refugee return and resettlement and the effect of sanctions on that? Yes, um, in my uh, introductory speech, I, I of course touched part of this when I spoke with ILO about refugees. The problem is that I feel, I feel now that uh, those countries who received refugees don't want them to get back to Syria. I don't know, I have this uh, impression. This because they are following strategies in order 
not to let Syria stand by itself. So refugees can go to their homeland safe and sound. Because if they want, if all, they always cry, we are suffering from refugees, we have a lack of everything, and we have infl uh, inflation and these things. Uh, for me, if you want these refugees, as Dr. Isa has said, you have to provide them with essential life conditions in their homeland. Nobody is, is happy, as Dr. Isa has said, to be a refugee, to be, while he, when he was in his country, he was having everything. And in one second, he lost everything, and then he has to move outside. Nobody is happy for this. So I guess if you want to make uh, refugees get back home, just let their home be better. This is the, the answer. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the, the time and effort in your um, very difficult situation there in Damascus. We're going to have to wrap up this conversation now, but... What an amazing discussion we've had with our two expert panelists. The abilities of this new technology to enable conversations that circle the whole globe still amazes me to have Dr. Adnan with us from Damascus and uh, <laughs> Dr. Um, Alice Rothschild with us from Seattle and um, many of us in between those two time zones. Um, today's session, like the preceding eight, is being recorded. We are building a permanent zone on our website where we're posting the links to all the videos and related materials so that this can be a continuing educational resource for people going forward. Um, I'm going to just remind people of the, uh, there we are. This is how you can access our Syria Resource Center, which is getting better day by day right now because um, Charlotte Cates and our web designer Luke Finzas have been working hard on it. Um, as you know, we have been providing this whole um, Common Sense on Syria project at no cost to attendees and other learners. So if you find this project worthwhile, please send us as generous of a donation as you can. I want to thank the many people who've already given to us to support this project. Really, the support has been very, very um, strong for us. But if you have not yet given to us to support the project, you can make a secure donation online or by check by clicking on the donate button at our website, www.justworldeducational.org. Um, friends, I had announced earlier that because of the imminent start of Ramadan, we've decided to postpone the final webinar scheduled for this series, the crucial one on ways to end the conflict in Syria. We're now planning to present that topic later, and indeed, it might be a mini-series of two or three webinars. It might just be one, who knows? It is such a crucial topic. So today's webinar is now the last in the present series. What a journey these past four weeks have been. I want to thank all of you who have been with us on one or more sessions of this learning adventure, including all of today's attendees, our Super Elf team, which includes our Just World Ed board members, Dr. Alice Rothschild and Rick Sterling, and our, and our amazing consultant, Charlotte Cates, and of course, today's two great panelists, Dr. Asa Shae, thank you for being with us today from London. Thank you for having me. Thank you. No, really, our pleasure. And uh, Dr. Adnan Azuz, thank you for being with us from Damascus, Syria today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me in this important session. Thank you very much.